Hey, it's Bill Van Lu. Today I want to show you a project I've been working on for a little while. If you've ever seen those smooth camera pans or slides in film or video productions, you know that they add some production value. And I've been interested in making one of those for a while. As I was browsing on Thingiverse, I came across a design for a really interesting version of one of those sliders for camera phones. So what I've been working on for the last couple weeks is printing and assembling this, as well as modifying a little bit. So this is my 3D printed camera phone slider. So in the video I'll show you how I printed this and how it works and show you some of the end results. Check it out. I started by bringing the model from Thingiverse into 3D design software called 123D Design. This is free software from Autodesk and I'd spent a lot of time in Google SketchUp before and Autodesk 123D Design seems much, much nicer. Maybe it's because I'm more comfortable with 3D Design in general with my experience with SketchUp, but 123D Design is, is really enjoyable to work on. So I actually modified the camera carriage where the camera sits slightly to make it wide enough to fit my camera in an OtterBox. And I also made a new version of the camera platform that was just flat at the top like you can see here so that I could drill it out and put a bolt up through the middle in order to put any camera on the slider. So once I had those finished, I exported those 3D files as STL files and then I opened up Cura. Now Cura is software that takes the 3D file saved as an STL and converts it into G-code, which is what the 3D printer uses to actually move in three dimensions. So here you can see that flat camera uh, carriage that rides along the rails. And what I'm doing is generating the G-code for the printer bot. Now anyone who's tried 3D printing knows that getting the first layer of the print to stick to the print bed is kind of make or break for ensuring print quality. And I definitely spent some time uh, playing with that and investigating why prints weren't sticking and getting things dialed in. One of the big things for me was printing on blue painter's tape. This is 3M blue painter's tape. This is 2090. Scotch blue 2090. I had tried some different tapes before, um, including one of their edge lock tapes, which actually has kind of a waxy layer, um, and that didn't work really well at all. Uh, but this combined with getting the Z alignment, in other words, the distance of the print head from the bed, getting that dialed in and using the blue painter's tape really made a big difference in getting quality prints. There you saw some of the failed prints that I came up with while I was trying to actually print it. But here you can see some footage of the printer actually working on printing the final products. Right now it's printing the end caps, which are the pieces that will hold the rods in place. And thankfully I was able to print those uh, two at a time. It needs two for the overall uh, project. And so it's printing those end caps together. And it's kind of mesmerizing to watch the machine. As I mentioned earlier, blue painter's tape is a good solution for getting those prints to stick to the print bed. In most cases, just peeling the tape up was enough to pop the object off the print bed. So you can see those end caps being popped off right now. Here's the camera carriage, the version that has the clip in there being printed and finishing off. And you might notice a little bit of stringy material on the bottom there. This was the only print out of that set that really developed that issue. And I'm not quite sure what happened there, but it flaked off pretty easily and, and cleaned up nicely. So not a big deal. Just not really quite sure what caused that. This is one of the things I've been learning about the 3D printing process is that there are lots and lots of different variables and lots of things to kind of play with and try. And uh, so I'm definitely building my, my understanding of 3D printing and my experience through projects like this. I did do a little bit of work in the outside workshop, even though it was uh, pretty cold out there. And what I'm doing here is just holding down that, that uh, rod in the vise so that I can saw it in half. I'm just going to use a hacksaw here. As I went back, I wonder if I may have actually clamped it down too hard in the vise because there's one spot on, the, on one rail that's um, not quite perfect, it seems like. I tried to be pretty careful with putting a cloth in the jaws of the vise so that it wouldn't damage the rail, but I wonder if I may have actually 
kind of damaged or dinged that rail just slightly. There's a slight imperfection there in one of them. So when I first tried to put the camera slider onto the rail, it fit really nicely in the end caps, but the slider itself, the carriage piece, didn't really quite fit. So I took just a little bit of sandpaper and sanded the insides of those pieces. I could have gone back, I guess, and tried reprinting them with the holes slightly larger, but it seemed easier to just clean them up a little bit with sandpaper. And once I got them cleaned up, it slid really nicely. I went a little too far on one of those, so there's a bit of wobble, but for the most part, I was really happy with how it turned out. The camera fit really nicely in that, in that clip with the OtterBox on it, and you can see a little bit of it in action right here. I'll show some test footage at the end of this video so you can really judge for yourself. Now one tip that I'll use is I'm using Hyperlapse by Instagram to record these slow camera pans. If you play it back in real time it does a nice job of smoothing out any kind of jittery stuff. So I also went into the workshop and took that flat camera slider and drilled it out for a quarter by 20 bolt. Now, of course, after I did this, I realized that I could have just printed it with the hole in place and saved myself a little bit of manual work, but it wasn't a big deal to just drill that out. So I popped that quarter by 20 bolt in there. That's the standard tripod mount. Put a washer on top to spread the weight a little bit and then screwed a nut down on top of it so that there would be a nice stud for the camera or ball head or whatever it was going to be to mount onto. And then I went back and tightened that down later. Here you can see how the whole thing assembles. There are two end caps, one that I just removed on the right side, and there's the other one on the left side. What I'm doing here is just sliding off the carriage that has the clip and sliding on the version that has a bolt up through the middle of it onto the rail. So having those end caps on there um, and having them be removable is pretty nice. I considered epoxying them uh, together, epoxying the rails into the end caps, but that would prevent me from being able to switch carriages between the clip and the bolt on one. Here I'm putting on that micro ball head that I think I mentioned in a couple of earlier videos uh, in the OtterBox camera case mod that I did. This is a really useful tool because it allows you to adjust the angle of the camera to basically anything. And the, the bowl had kind of come loose a little bit here. But once that was on, I was able to clip on my OtterBox mod, uh, the case mount mod that I did for my OtterBox, and screw that on. And that also provided a really nice stable camera platform uh, for the smartphone but you could just as easily put any reasonably small lightweight camera on there as well. Here's a little bit of it in action sliding across the rails. I do have a couple fingers on there to keep it steady because this one I sanded just a little too far and it does wobble a little bit on the carriage. I think if I were to do this over I might spread it out so it was wider. But overall for a first test I'm pretty happy with this. That footage was a little bumpy. Now this project definitely isn't perfect and I even almost consider it unfinished. I've thought about using a gear motor or a stepper motor combined with something like an Arduino to actually include some electronics and power this to do things like powered time lapses uh, as the camera is traveling across there controlling this so that I don't have to be there manually sliding it. And there's definitely varying degrees of quality in terms of how smoothly it slides. I find I have to hold it really uh, carefully to ensure that it doesn't wobble. Um, I also think that having a wider carriage or a pair of carriages with something that goes across would give a little more stability. It would also decrease the amount of travel that it had across the rails, but I think that's okay. But for a first try at a big project like this, I think I'm really pleased overall. So you can judge for yourself. This is some test footage shot using the camera slider rig and shot in hyperlapse by Instagram. Using this allows me to smooth out that footage so any little bumps that I might introduce by sort of jostling the slider get smoothed out because of the built-in stabilization effects that Hyperlapse has. Here's one more little test slide. And like I said, I'm really pleased with this thing. So thanks for watching. By all means, check me out on social media. Subscribe to my channel here on YouTube and follow me on Instagram for more daily sort of updates in between the big build videos like this. Thanks a lot.